I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. We've been programmed from early age, like school, college, job. We've been kind of programmed on this alternative path that's not the hero's journey. If you've been so heavily programmed, how can you begin to find out or figure out or determine what is your, your journey to be a hero? Well, of course, I can't look in anybody's mind, but I would bet you that um, almost anyone, if you confronted them and said, what is your destiny? Tell me the first thing that pops into your head, something would pop into somebody's head. And I think people's destiny is much closer to the surface in their minds than we may think it is, you know? When you and I tell a story, it's being compared. The reader, the listener, is kind of comparing it to that template that's in their soul and sort of saying, does this ring true or does this not ring true? And people sometimes, when if you miss a beat, you the storyteller in the hero's journey, people will kind of come out of the theater and they'll go, hey, I didn't really like it, so I didn't really quite, you know, it didn't grab me, you know? Tell me what you learned on the, the porn movie because I thought that was very interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, I got, uh, I got hired to do a rewrite on a porn movie and uh, the producer took me out to breakfast and uh, just gave me kind of two marching orders. And both of these turned out to be tremendously valuable to me in other genres. Forget about porn. That's what I mean. Again, painting versus yeah, right. songwriting. So that was great. So, I, I learned more on this thing in like one day. And the first thing he said was, when you get to a sex scene, don't let the story stop. I don't want it to be talk, 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 screw, screw, screw. He says, make sure that the story advances through the sex scene. You know, if it's a, like a private eye at sleeping with a girl, uh, she's got to tell him something, you know, or he spots something in her bedroom, you know, a photograph of something that, that advances the story. And I thought, wow, that is perfectly applicable, say, to action scenes. So, Stephen Pressfield, you know, I've been trying to interview you for two years, and when you finally said yes, 
rather than do it over been Skype. You've avoiding you for two years. You've been avoiding me for two years. <laughs> rather than just do it on Skype or whatever, I flew 3,000 miles to come to your beautiful house in Malibu or overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Uh, thank you once again for agreeing to come on the podcast. I'll say who you are. Probably many people or most people know who you are. You wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance, excellent book and then movie. Uh, you wrote Gates of Fire was another big, no, you wrote many novels, Gates of Fire, The Profession, a whole bunch of things. Um, but The Gates of Fire, that's like mandatory reading at West Point. Uh, so it's a great military novel. Uh, you uh, are, are, I would say, uh, you're also very well known for The War of Art, Turning Pro, Do the Work, The Warrior Ethos, Nobody Wants to Read wow, Your Shit, had you The Authentic Swing. Years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and now you just came out with a book, The Knowledge, which kind of is your the first time you've written kind of a personal book about your own story of dealing with what you call the resistance. And uh, so thanks once again for coming on the podcast. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm delighted that we're finally doing this, James. Why do you agree? Um, I guess realistically because of the knowledge. I wanted to do something to promote the book and get it out there. Okay. And also, I, you know, I've been sort of researching you from time to time, and I thought, this is an interesting dude. i got to meet this guy. You know, okay, see good. what's happening. You know? Yeah. Well, well so, so let's start with the book, The Knowledge. Um, this is... Uh, your 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 the setting is in the seventies. The Stephen Pressfield character, or you know the, the 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 character in the book, is driving a cab, and you know Stretch is driving a cab and uh, is trying is a struggling writer. And all the conflicts that happen, he gets it's kind of this de- almost this detective noir style with his you know his boss hires him to follow his wife. So it's very kind of classic, almost Raymond Chandler noir. Uh, but it's set in the seventies, basically you. And that all represents your your kind of that's the the you bring the internal struggle struggle of being a writer to the external story. So am I summarizing it exactly? Accurately? You're doing a great job, yeah. And 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 you keep it going. It's a cliffhanger. Uh, I mean, it's it, every chapter is, but it's really also about the struggle of being an artist. It, it yeah, it is. It's like um, I was I've been writing from post in my blog, as you know, about this thing. Um, with the heading being using your real life in fiction, which is what the knowledge is in terms of, from a writer's point of view, was my real life, what really happened to me, and then how to tell that in fiction and make it not boring and not navel-gazing and not da-da-da-da-da-da. So um, I sort of, the, the principle there is making the internal external so that the uh, the underlying, is this what you wanted to yeah, talk yeah, about? Yeah, it? yeah. The underlying story, the true story, was my struggle as a writer to try to, you know, get out of my own way and stop screwing up. At that time, I think I'd written three unpublished and unpublishable novels. So I was doing the, completing the third one, you know, driving a cab, tending bar, blah, 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 blah. And that one was rejected. You that one was rejected, in, in this too. novel, you describe yeah. how that was rejected. Yeah. And also dealing with a lot of personal stuff, divorce, bum ba bum ba bum but, that, but to tell that story would just be boring. It would be a snooze. And I've tried for years to sort of tell that story. So that's where the kind of detective story comes in. I sort of did a kind of a big Lebowski type of detective story and laid that sort of fictional version on top of the, the true internal story of a, of a struggling writer and made them cohere, made them cohere on the same theme. And, uh, and it worked. Well, you know, it's interesting because this described your resistance to being a writer. And it was all these things going on, like the divorce, the detective stuff, the, the driving a cab, your own frustrations about being rejected while you learn the skill. But it's not just about writing. I mean, entrepreneurs go through that. Yeah. Like entrepreneurs try to start a company. They fail. They start another one. They fail. Then they might start another one that succeeds. Any type of artist goes through that. As you mentioned once in one interview, anytime you go from sort of a lower level to trying a, to go to a higher level, like let's say you're out of shape and you want to go to the gym, you're going to meet this resistance. Exactly. And so we all, it's all the same story. Yeah. And, and, and battling that resistance, I feel is in itself the arc of the hero. That is a story, right? Like you're I gonna, think it is. In many ways, it's every story. If you think about it, it right. really is sort of the hero's journey, you know, from Joseph Campbell or from C.G. Young, you know, where 
where the hero starts out in the ordinary world, receives the call, enters the extraordinary world, and then it's all sort of duels against his own self-created sabotage, resistance, whatever it is, until the hero finally kind of returns home, having overcome, hopefully, or at least gained a perspective on what that internal enemy has been. All Whether it's the Odyssey, Odysseus doing that thing, or Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, you know, that it's, it is, it's every story. So, it's the Jesus Christ story is that story. You so know? let's go with Luke Skywalker for a second. Although I do want to get to Jesus also, <laughs> now that you bring him up. But uh, Luke Skywalker, it's just not like he wants to be a writer. In fact, there are no books in the entire universe of Star Wars. Like I've never once seen anyone reading a book. Wow, you're right. I never even thought about that. Yeah, wow. no, there's huh? nobody reads in Star Wars. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's an illiterate you don't society. see Han Solo in a paper, but no. Right. Yeah. Huh. So, so Luke Skywalker, though, he wants to be a fighter pilot in the very beginning. He that, but he can't. He's his uncle says no, you have to stay, and he can't. But then he gets his call to action. R two D two shows Princess Leia, and he wants to get out there, but he still can't quite until he meets his. So 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 so, so tell me how this c- compare this side by side with the 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 journey to be a writer. Okay, that's a great question. Great question. Um, now, Luke is the son of a Jedi Knight, right? In fact, he's Darth Vader's right. son, right? So that equates to he has a destiny, right? We meet him, and he's on the evaporator farm with Aunt Veru and Uncle Lowen, right? Uh, so he, as far as he's concerned, he's just a schmuck going out tending the evaporator machines, right? But he knows in his heart that he has a destiny because he is the son of a Jedi Knight, and he wants to be a Jedi Knight. And so I think that's any creative person, an entrepreneur, somebody that wants to start a business, somebody that wants to write a ballet or do anything like that, we each kind of feel inside us. There's something in there. Nobody's recognizing us. You know, they think we're geeks. They think we're losers, whatever it is, right? But we feel this this call. And, and this, can I, can I interrupt just a second? I'm sorry, I'm an interrupter yeah. a little bit. Yes. Um, even if someone's just has like their daily job, like someone's listening to this, they're going to their daily job that maybe they like, maybe they don't like, maybe they're feeling stuck. But I do think it's true. Everybody feels some calling to go from, to basically have more, unleash more potential in their lives. And there, and there is this resistance to it. No, I have to pay the bills. No, I have a safe job. No, I don't have the education for that or the skills or whatever. So, okay, so Luke, you know, is on the evaporator farm, but he feels this call, but he can't do it yet. And then, you know, R2-D2 shows up and there's a message from Princess Leia and he decides, oh, let's take it to old Ben Kenobi, this, you know, crazy guy who lives out in wherever he lives. And it just turns out that Obi-Wan Kenobi is the mentor figure, right? And George Lucas says, I know you know the story, stole it, you know, straight from the hero with a thousand faces and went, you know, beat by beat through the hero's journey. So Luke receives the call, which comes at the end of Act One in any classic story, right? And uh, usually a mentor, but he's afraid. Following the call is always the refusal of the call. I know you know this all, everything with James, but- No, but you know what though? It's it's not always so clear to me because with every story, there's tweaks. You have kind of like the framework, but then the artist- Right. Improvises in the framework. It gets expressed in a certain way, but yet the framework almost never changes, you know? Um, The story of Odysseus, when they came to summon him uh, to go to the Trojan War, he he pretended he was plowing the field and he pretended to sow salt in the field because he wanted to show he was crazy. That's like a refusal of the call. And then whoever it was that was sent for to, to bring him put his baby Telemachus in the path of the plow. And when Odysseus stopped the oxen, didn't run over his little baby, he said, ah, you, you're, you're lingering here. You know, and they drafted him for the, for, the, uh, for the Trojan War. But that's so the refusal of the call. And, and then, so Luke refuses the call when Obi Wan says, "You must go. We'll come with me and train to be a Jedi Knight." And he says, "No, I have to stay." Yeah, my we, aunt. My, yeah, right. And then it's what the Sand People killed his, his aunt and his uncle. Right. So now he has to go. But usually, it's the mentor that gives the young hero the inspiration and the courage to respond to the call. And then it's like. Uh, Dorothy and the tornado and she's gone from Kansas, right? And she's into the into the um 
the extraordinary world or the inverted world. Now that's the case though, Wizard of Oz is an interesting one. She's passively brought into this alternative world, this special world, you know, because the tornado picks her up. She didn't make it back. Somehow or other, the people in the, her family said, oh, we can't find Dorothy. So they shut the door and just let her survive in the tornado. And that takes her to the special yeah. world. As opposed to Luke, where his, his aunt and uncle are killed. He's got no other choice now. He decides to, to go with Obi-Wan. But that, in a way, is an external event that yeah, he, he didn't cause. But in any event, what you were saying about somebody that's, uh, somebody that's working a job, and you know, I think... Maybe the, the call, quote unquote, is not necessarily to write a movie or a novel or to start a business, but it's a call to be who you really are, right? That may be finding love. It may be finding, you know, marrying the person that you want to marry and having a family. It may, whatever it is, but we all sort of feel that like we were born into the wrong family. It's like we look around, whoop, my brother, my sister, what, what am I here with? You know, that, that we're, we're not yet who we are, right? Who we really are. And that's kind of the call. And then resistance is the equal and opposite force in reality that always resists that, that always puts into our minds, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I haven't got the guts, why me, do I deserve it? Why should I write this book? It's been done a thousand times already, better than all, you know, all those excuses. And um, so the hero's journey is kind of a series of confronting those obstacles. But what's also interesting in the hero's journey is that there are allies that come to you in every story, right? Even Conan the Barbarian is like a classic, you know, the original Arnold Schwarzenegger version where he, he meets these, you know, these sort of magical creatures and magical friends that help him. And that happens too, you know, I'm sure it's happened in your life many, many times, you know, you and I here today, in a way, are sort of magical friends for each other on some sort, nice of, some, <laughs> some, some sort of journey, you know, which we might not, might not be clear to us right now, but, you know, what brought you to come out here 3,000 miles, among the other things that you're doing, you know? So, so, okay, so Luke, I, I want to stick with Luke as Jedi and you as writer, okay. just for a second. Okay. And then uh, we don't have to do a lot Facebook Live anymore, because <laughs> it has to always anticipate. Okay. So, I'll, I'll, I'll so is this going out. out over Facebook now? Right now, a second, yeah. Say hello to your audience. They love you. Hey, hey <laughs> Stephen Pressfield, War of Art, Turning Pro, Do the Work, Warrior Ethos, Legend of Bagger Vance. All right, stay tuned for the okay. rest the podcast. <laughs> Bye. So, so, so Luke is, he goes out there, you're writing your novels, they're unpublished, he's learnt, first learning his skills. That's the parallel I see there. And then what, what kind of happens next on this, you know, arc of the hero? I think it's, it's a series, these are great questions, by the way. Um, and I'm sure that what I'm telling you is just something you've lived in your own life anyway. I have, but, but then I, but I've never, I, I've only, when I was reading your books, I started to really conceive of it as this is not really this notion of resistance that you talk about, which is really this kind of wall of excuses we always put up when we're trying to go from low to high. We always have, we paper our comfort zone with excuses. So we can't, so we stay comfortable and we don't do that uncomfortable thing, which you call the resistance. But I realize that in itself is the story, is the arc of the hero, is, is battling that resistance. We internally have, that's why it's so uh, maybe archetypical, is we all have that, that battle of resistance inside of us. Yeah, we do. And it's just sort of a series of, you conquer one and another one arises. And you can't, you know, you move to the next level and then the next level of resistance arises. But it's almost always about belief in yourself and belief in your destiny, right? And resistance sort of takes the form of self-doubt, you know? Do I dare take the next step and, and, and uh, you know, open this next company or open this next door or pursue love in this particular way or take a chance in this way? And the voice is always, no, 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 don't do that. And... And it's the constant sort of escalating bit. And I'm sure that death is probably the final thing, in, you know, at least in the material plane, where we sort of, you know, let go and say, well, here it is. Well, it's funny because with death, death, there's a kind of um, one way out, right? But with writing a novel 
or or seeking some other higher goal, you have to use discernment to say, am I pursuing the right goal? There's not one way out. There's many ways out. Mm. So how did you know? I mean, you, you kind of say uh, in several places you, you always wanted to be a writer. And uh, but how did you know? How did you have the discernment to, to, to keep on going against all the resistance as opposed to saying, you know what? I'm going to start a garment company. Uh, you know, I'm, I'll be a garmento in New York City. <laughs> That's another, that's another great question. And like I, as you know, I used to work in advertising in New York. And, and the way, among the many jobs I've had, I would work in an ad agency in New York, save up my money, quit, write a novel, you know, go somewhere cheap, write a novel. It would fail. I wouldn't get it published. i go back, I'd grovel, I'd get another advertising job, bump it, bump it, bump and doing other jobs along the way. And many times, or at least a number of times, People, I'm sure this has happened to you many times, your boss calls you into the office and says to you, we're going to promote you to be, why give up this crazy dream? What do you, you know, I'm only doing this because I care about you, James, you know, stop with this thing. You're never going to. And uh, every time that happened to me, I would say to myself, they're right. They're so right. Why am I doing this? I've written these novels. Nobody wants them. I'm no good. I don't know. Da, 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 da. But I could never pull the trigger and do that. I always said, screw it, I'm leaving, you know, give me my check, I'm leaving. And I don't even know why I did, I just could, I just had no other choice, you know? So, so again, it's like uh, just comparing you with Luke Skywalker for one more second. Uh, it's like you said, he had By this the internal... way, Mark Hamill lives right down the hill from here. Really? He lives in We're gonna visit him next. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, does he, do you ever run into him in the store and I've he tells you? Him, no. What happened? Okay, we, we, we won't. I saw a guy that. with kind of a cowl, you know, from behind, you know, but it wasn't. It wasn't. That's funny. So, so you're saying earlier, you were saying he ha he felt this internal call. Maybe he didn't know why. You were feeling this internal call for you. You wanted to be a writer, and and I think in the '60s and in the '70s there was much more of the concept of writer as hero in, in our culture. You had... True, that's you know, kind of gone. <laughs> it's, it's totally gone. I mean, you had everybody from like, you know, uh, Norman Mailer to Alex Haley writing about Malcolm X to um, you know, everybody, Philip right. Roth, they were all People writing. who are hearing this don't even know who Norman Mailer is or who Alex Haley is, I'm sure. That, that could be. Yeah. And so, but but these people were, were culturally significant. Yeah. Norman Mailer ran for mayor in New York City. Yeah. So, so it started The Village Voice. Yeah. Um, and now you don't really have the writer as culturally significant right now. Uh, but, but yet just as many people or more want to be writers. I mean, as Seth has pointed out many times, two million books were, were published yeah. last year. Yeah. I can tell you from my blog that many, many people are out there, you know, with the dream of being a writer. So that dream hasn't gone away, even though the Norman Mailers of the world, you know, they, you know, the, the culture doesn't value that anymore, you know. So, so, so you're in the '70s. You're, you're, you're deciding like, look, I'm not gonna. I'm choosing not to rise up through the ranks of the advertising world. I'm going to one way or the other make it as a writer. Uh, and and that's when you start, I guess, kind of formulating this idea of the resistance. All of the things that are going to try to convince you. Oh, it, it, and it's not just internal things. It's external things as well. It's your it's your friends saying, "Don't do this." It's your boss saying be promoted, exactly, it's, yeah. it's the publisher saying, you're no good. Right, right. You know, so again, how do you not believe everybody who you've ever trusted in the past for your entire life? For me, I just didn't have a choice is all I can say. Every time I would come to one of those moments where I, with the fork in the road, I just couldn't take that other fork. I just had to keep trying. And then I began getting a little bit of success. I moved out here to LA and uh, I, I had an agent and he put me together with a, an, a, a, an established writer, a screenwriter, and, we had, and suddenly we were, you know, or at least I, he already had been in play. I was now in play with him. So that encouraged me. I thought, oh, well, I'm getting somewhere. You know, I'm actually getting a paycheck here and I'm learning and da 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 da. So from that point on, it was like Luke Skywalker first getting, you know, in an X-Wing and he realizes, wow, I can fly this thing. You know, I've got the genes. Well, well, the, well, there's several things. There's He starts to realize he has additional skills that he wasn't sure of. So you, you get out here and you realize, oh, I can write dialogue. I can write, you know, a three-act 
movie, and he gets a new cohort of friends. Right, uh, got Han Solo, he's yeah. got Princess Leia, right? Yeah. You know, and then he has a mission. Yeah, then he has a mission. Now he's on the journey, right? right. So it's a lot easier at that stage, right? He's not completely alone with his own self-doubts. But, but the resistance still exists. Like, it, you never yes, quite never get ends. rid of it. No, it never ends for a minute. You always have to, even now, you have to convince yourself you're a writer. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I'm just, I'm working on a project now that um, when I had the idea, which was maybe eight or nine months ago, and it's a really good idea, I, I, I was ready to abandon it. I happened to have, I had this couple of guys I have breakfast with every day. They kind of talked me out of it, talked me into it. Don't throw it away, don't throw it away. So in other words, the resistance was still so strong, even after all these years. And, uh, you know, all the way through the project, same way. You know, one, one thing I really uh, admire about your attempts and abilities to overcome the res the, this resistance, and the resistance other people call writer's block, or other people call uh, fear of success, and other people call fear of failure. There's lots of different forms of it. But I like how basically, and don't take this the wrong way because I do the exact same thing, you're basically a criminal, <laughs> uh, because I don't and, take that the wrong way at all. I think it's great. And and you and you describe. I mean, everybody who reads the Legend of Bagger Vance knows this already. But but uh, and that's that your your classic story of uh, a golfer overcoming his own internal demons from fighting in the war and to becoming you know what he tr finding his authentic swing, so he can become truly a great golfer in the midst of this. Golf match. I won't give away the whole legend of Bagger fans, but you wrote this book, The Authentic Swing, which describes how you basically modeled the story beat by beat, just how you described George Lucas did with Star Wars. You modeled it beat by beat for, uh, with the Bhagavad Gita, the story of Krishna and Arjuna. In fact, the main character of Legend of Bagger Vance, his last name is Juna. So it's very direct, the, the connection. And I find that that technique works very well. Taking a classic story. It does. And it's, it, and I'm going to use a, 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 a 1990s phrase or 1980s phrase. It, that story has been focus grouped because we know the Bhavagat Gita is a good story because for the past 2,500 years, a billion people have loved it. So that's a huge focus group. So you know if you can take that story beat by beat and apply it to golf or chess or business or whatever, you're going to have a great story. If you do it right, is that was that your sense going into the Legend of Bagger Vance? Pretty much. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the book doesn't follow. It, it really follows the the setup of the Bhagavad Gita. But that was kind of all that all that I needed to get it rolling. But I'm definitely a believer in stealing stuff like you know great things like Romeo and Juliet. You know, just steal it beat for beat. You know. Well, and even uh, even the knowledge um, is very classic noir. Now you have your own. Exactly. The, I think that the sign of the artist is you have your own twist, but you hit the you hit the beats you had to hit. In fact, in my blog today, my post today was talking. It was it's called "Pick a Genre and Run with It." It's the title, right. and it's and uh, the uh, my partner Sean, when he read the first draft of the knowledge. He said, immediately he said, this is the big Lebowski. That's exactly what this is. It's, it's a private eye story, but instead of a private, hard-boiled private eye, it's kind of a bumbling, regular person, right? Like the dude was, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, as I say in this blog post, immediately I, I said, well, how can I steal? If that's true, and it is true, what beats can I steal? And I, one of the things... That uh, you should, this is what we want to talk about, right? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I want to talk about all of this stuff. All right. Uh, the first thing I, that is in every private eye story is the private eye always gets beaten up, right? Jake Giddies gets beaten up. You know, the dude gets beaten up like three or four times. So I, so I literally said to myself as I'm structuring it, I says, "Well, write a beat up scene," you know. And then, and, and then another thing is that the private eye always falls in love with the, with the woman who hires him. If a woman hires him, right, always becomes romantically involved. It's, if it's uh, Humphrey Bogart with Marie Astor or whatever her name was. And uh, so, yeah, I'm a big believer in stealing these classic, it's really a genre. A genre has conventions. A thriller has all in certain beats, you know. And if you don't hit those beats and you're the writer, 
people read it and they go, the hell is this? You know, I don't like this story, you know? Because, because maybe because they're not feeling what we discussed earlier, which is that even that person who works in an office or a cubicle, they're feeling that internal calling to do something else. And they're going to hit in their own lives the, those beats at different points. And so they're going to resonate if you hit those beats in the story. Exactly. And if you miss them, they're going to not, they're not going to be happy. And I was having this discussion with a friend of mine who's a very... Uh, extremely, let's call it, literary author, and was describing to her actually the story code written by your partner Sean Coyne, uh-huh. and um, uh, and and how you know maybe you can write within, you can be literary but within genre. Just hit those beats, and then be as literary as you want in between the beats. And what did she say? She didn't believe it. Ah, <laughs> literary is literary. They don't want the, they don't want to be told you need a beat up scene. Ah. Well, like, I don't, of course, I don't know who your friend is or I don't know anything about it, but I would bet you if we had Sean here and he could take her books and break them down, she would be amazed at how many beats she hit just instinctively. You know, not that I'm saying you have to do a formula, 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 but their stories are, 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 are stories for a reason. You know, the detective gets beaten up for a reason. You know, Luke Skywalker has to raise the X-Wing out of the swamp for a reason. And Yoda appears for a reason because, the, you know, it's the hero's journey. It's that template that's inside us in our, in our collective unconscious. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional, and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, 
I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll sign up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious, like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best, from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So let's let's go through the main parts of the hero's journey again, and and I know you know it backwards and forwards, but really it it's it's not the easiest thing to understand. I have to say, uh, in general. So there, but there are the, the the basic components. There's kind of you're living your average life. Then there's the call to action to some higher calling, and there's the mentor who kind of brings you along. And then what happens? Then the, the underlying thing here, and I'm not, I don't really know this completely. Uh, it's sort of vague in my mind too. But the underlying concept is that in the, in the first act, when we first meet the hero in the ordinary world, whether it's Dorothy in Kansas or Luke in, on the evaporator farm, they've already got a destiny. They're like a, an acorn that has the coating for this oak, right? It's already there. And that's true of anybody that's in the cubicle or whatever it is. It's their real self that's, that's waiting to come out. Or like, uh, did you see the movie Joy? Yeah. About Joy Mancuso, you know, yeah. I love David O. Russell. And that's, you know, he, now you could see that with her. She was this little girl who was cutting out little 
uh, dolls and uh, making a little world of her own. And then uh, somehow that creativity got squashed out of her by her crazy dysfunctional family, but it was in her. And then, you know, 17 years later, it popped out again, right? So that became her hero's journey, was inventing the miracle mop and then fighting all of the battles that she had to fight, right? So the, the, uh, the central uh, odyssey in the hero's journey, act two, what we would call it, would be kind of successive obstacles um, that the hero must overcome and certain uh, allies that the hero acquires along the way. Like if we were, we were talking in Native American terms, it might be a, a talking crow might appear, right? Or a talking coyote, you know, a, a spirit animal would become to guide them. But then they'd also have like, uh, let me flash to another example, like Conan the Barbarian. If you remember, there's a scene where he meets this seductive woman and uh, she lures him into her little place, you know, to make love. And then she turns out to be this banshee, right, that throws herself at him and he barely, you know, that that's another beat in the hero's journey where it's sort of the witch that that someone encounters, you know, the uh, something that seems to be something, but then turns out to be, uh, you know, really hostile force ready to, and that could be... Could be a, a boss promoting you. Exactly. It's just could what I was going to say. Could be a publisher say. rejecting you. Yeah. Somebody, uh, Donald Trump, calling you up and saying, would, would you like to be in my cabinet, you know? No. <laughs> but, you know, that's so... And, and where do these beats come from? I mean, they come from the collective experience of the human race over thousands and thousands of years. I'm sure that it really comes down to the the hunting band, right? The, we're sitting around the cave. Somebody says, hey, we're hungry. That's the call, right? So you got to go out, grab your spear, you and your buddies, you know, you go out and then crazy shit happens, right? You run into a mastodon or, you know, or saber-toothed tiger, whatever happens, right? Some guy hurts their foot. Now you have to kind of lug this guy along. Should we help him, you know? And then you meet a woman that's kind of lost. She's blind. She has a little orphan. She's walking with a stick. And then she somehow tells you, oh, you know, over the hill, that's right where the, the mastodon, you know, valley is, You get right? These things kind of happen in real life over and over and over. And I think that became imprinted in our unconscious over however many millions of years. And that's, and that's there right now. So when you and I tell a story, it's being compared. The reader, the listener is kind of comparing it to that template that's in their soul and sort of saying, does this ring true or does this not ring true? And people sometimes, when if you miss a beat, you the storyteller in the hero's journey, People will kind of come out of the theater and they'll go, hey, I didn't really like it. So it didn't really quite, you know, it didn't grab me, you know. But some smart story person, analyst, could go back in and say, ah, you missed the beat with the witch. You didn't have the one where the woman tries to seduce him and she turns out to be a banshee. Oh, you know, you know, and that somehow people miss that. Well, so, so now we're kind of in this, um, you're, you're describing basically the act two of the hero's journey. Yeah. But I want to, I want to, pull out just a little bit back and say, let's say again, you're, you're in the cubicle or you're listening to this in the gym or, or in the car. How do you, you knew you wanted to be a writer and, and Luke didn't know, but like you say, he was like an acorn. He had this destiny to be a, a, a Jedi and Dorothy had this destiny to do go to Oz and so on. How does somebody, if, if they're so you, we've been programmed from early age, like school, college, job, We've been kind of programmed on this alternative path that's not the hero's journey. And how can, if you've been so heavily programmed, how can you begin to find out or figure out or determine what is your, your journey to be a hero? Well, of course, I can't look in anybody's mind, but I would bet you that um, almost anyone, if you confronted them and said, what is your destiny? Tell me the first thing that pops into your head, something would pop into somebody's head. You know, uh, if you ever watch Tony Robbins work with people, you know, where he gets up in their face and, you know, uses swear words and everything like that. He's just trying to shake them out of that programming. And, and uh, I think it's much, people's destiny is much closer to the surface in their minds than we may think it is, you know? Um, and it doesn't have to be some exalted thing. Like I say, it can be just, you know, 
finding your mate and having a family. And it doesn't have you know? to be one thing either, because look, no, you, you went be, from... No, it doesn't have to at all. I mean, after your third unpublished novel, you went into screenwriting. You yeah. Know, for many years. Which saved For me. decades. Yeah. So, yeah. And it wasn't until uh, like two ge- decades later, Legend of Bagger Vance exactly. came out. It was your first published novel at age 51. Yeah. By the way, I got to say, James, thank you for doing the research that you've done and being prepared, you know, for this interview. It really, it's great for the listeners and it's great for me. Well, it's, it's interesting for me because when I say, okay, look, I want to write a novel. I've written a bunch of books. I've written my unpublished novel, uh, unpublishable novels when I was in my 20s. I can tell by looking at you, you'd be a great novelist. Please do it. But but when I read that you were 51 with Legend of Packer Vance, that was, uh, you know, inspiring to me. The second thing was with The Authentic Swing, I tried out as a technique. I wrote a nonfiction blog post where I took the four noble truths of Buddhism and without mentioning Buddhism at all, I figured, okay, these four noble truths have been focus grouped. They've been for 2,300 years, uh, you know, accepted by a billion people. I wrote the four things you need to know as an entrepreneur. And I just took the four noble truths and just put entrepreneurship in there. Uh-huh. And, and it, it worked was like one of my most popular posts ever. Uh. So things, these ideas work and people should know. And it's just like, you know, um, when somebody takes the idea of Google and brings it to Russia, I forgot the name of the Russian search engine, but... That's uh-huh. a multi-billion dollar company now. Yeah. Or, or Weibo in China is like Twitter here is a multi-billion dollar company. So, so structures that work well by hundreds of millions of people will work in other you know, genres or locations or professions or whatever. So these, yes. these are techniques for success, not just for, for writing. You know, they're techniques for peak performance. But we still have this resistance. So you still had to... You know, after decades of screenwriting where you were starting to break out and be successful, you had a movie come out. It wasn't maybe the best success, but you had it come out. You quit and said, I got to write this novel. So that was resistance to your agent. You said fired you. Yeah. What was that like? Did you did you at any point? It sounds so easy in retrospect. But did you regret like, oh, my God, I'm about to break out in Hollywood. Should I really try to write spend two years writing a novel? Uh, you know, I, I don't remember it absolutely clearly, but I know that the idea for The Legend of Bagger Vance came to me very much as a book. And it just came to me in a complete flash, right? And, uh, and I had this meeting with my agent, and I remember he basically really put it to me. He said, I can't, you know, let you, you know, I've been working too hard to get your career going. You know, you're just about to get going. Now you're going to go away and write a book. You know, so he's the banshee right here. He, he is the banshee. But of course, he's absolutely right. And I could see it. You know, I mean, it wasn't like I thought he was crazy. But again, for whatever reason, I just had to do it. When I say it now, looking back, I knew n- not really true. I mean, I went through agonies through all these things, all of these decisions that I now say to you simply, I just didn't take the job. But I would, you know, go through just the agonies you would imagine of, of resistance, you know. Who am I to think that I could write something that anybody would care? I've been doing this for 16 years. Nothing has happened. Am am I an idiot? You know, and I can remember one time when I was working in advertising in New York, my boss drove me home and we were driving up the west side up into Westchester. I was going to my parents' place and we passed by. It was winter. and There was some poor homeless guy you know, by the side of the road. And he said to me, yeah, he said, Steve, that's you. That's going to be you out there, you know, because he knew that I'd been sort of doing that kind of stuff. So, so this is the, the, the to friends myself, who are... Well, my top of my head exploded. I thought, he's absolutely right. That's me. That's just what's going to happen to me, you know. So it wasn't so easy. I didn't really know, quote unquote. You know? Then, then why did you keep doing it? Like, like your friend came, might have been right. When it came down to it, James, I just couldn't. Do any anything else? I just couldn't, you know. I just said I'm got to keep trying this thing. So when when um, I'll, I'm going to get to Act Three of your story here, uh, and maybe we can relate it back to the arc of the hero. So you you write Legend of Bagger Vance. It kind of pours out of you. You describe it in in a very different way as des- the way you describe writing your other previous novels. True. Um, it just sort of poured out of you and. It, it presumably got accepted by a publisher and it got published. I right imagine. away, very incredibly fast. After ye- years and years of failure, 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 all of a sudden, bang. And how did that, what was, how did that feel, that moment? Uh, it felt great, you know? 
It felt like, uh, ah, finally, this is, I'm sure it's what Donald Trump felt when he, when he looked at the results on the election night. But no, I thought, well, finally something worked. You know, it's like rolling the dice a thousand times and it's, finally it's, it comes up, you know. But it's funny you say finally something worked. Like here you had already worked on like three or four movies at, prior to that. You know, you had had some, But nothing that was really mine and nothing that, uh, you know. Nothing, nothing that, that super really proud of. came out of me that was really me, you know. So, so, uh, so things start to happen. Uh, was it immediate that uh, movie producers were also calling? That happened really fast too, yeah. Uh, it was one person named Jake Eberts who was associated with Robert Redford and they wanted it right away. But that was just luck, you know? And then, um, I mean, even that seems kind of magical how it kind of came together. I mean, who, who, who writes their first novel and then suddenly Matt Damon and Will Smith are starring in the movie? Like, it all yeah, seemed... Too bad to... it wasn't a good movie, but in any event... Well... But that was, I feel like that was like, after all the years of bad luck that I had and things that might have worked but didn't, maybe, you know, it was evening out a little bit, you know? But also maybe kind of that... Um, Pushing against the resistance builds up this kind of um, potential energy that turns into kinetic energy once it uh, once it gets unleashed, once it launches. Maybe. <laughs> like you launched with Legend of Bagger Vans and Maybe. now, bam, you had 20 years of potential energy behind it. Could be. I mean, there's all these different ways of looking at the resistance, I feel. Um, but, okay, so Arc of the Hero, you, you have many battles, many problems, uh, many beats. What, what's the beginning of Act 3? It's usually, uh, remember the scene in um, the first Indiana Jones where he, he grabs the idol off of, he's in the cave, and then this huge rock, this boulder, this, this mm -hmm. round thing, coming, and he's racing away, right? Yeah. That's, again, it's George Lucas, you know, stealing the, you know, the hero's journey again. Usually the, the third act is the hero gets what he was after. He's entered this alien realm, wherever it is, and gets what he's after, and now he's got to get home with it. It's the treasure, it's the princess, it's the, you know, the original Declaration of Independence with Nicolas Cage, whatever it is. And th the third act is trying to get home with, with that stuff, you know, or getting back to whoever's going to pay you for it, or, you know, who's ever going to sing your praises because you did it. And... Uh, it's Odysseus coming back from Troy, trying to get home to Ithaca. And then a whole new sort of series of adventures happened there of, of uh, things trying to, there's a helicopter hovering right there. It's never a good sign out here. What does let it usually just, mean? Let me just take a look. It could mean a fire, but um, pardon me in the middle of our interview. No, no problem. It's either that or Charlie Sheen just got arrested down on an island. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> when we used to, if you would go into town and you'd see like the CNN vans at the courthouse, oh, it was like Charlie Sheen is appearing, you know, once that's, again. That's funny. Something's happening down there. Maybe it's just a highway wreck or something. Anyway, so that's act three is the kind of the coming home. Part. So so in this case, like in, in the Star Dorothy Wars Dorothy coming back to Kansas. Right. Or, or does it start with her? Well, it starts with her basically un unveiling the, uh, the wizard. Yeah. So, so then it's kind of this resolution after that. We, we've, we've got to where we're going, we've got the prize, we've got the wizard, but we have to, there's some further truth that has to be discovered. Yeah. And, and I feel like, again, that, that is not only about storytelling, but it's about uh, living life. And you, you refer to it in several books in two different ways. In one book, you call it, the book's Turning Pro, and you call it, that's the difference between an amateur and professional. So an amateur gets to this point where, He's finally sitting down writing, maybe, but he's got to now turn pro to really kind of make that, that leap. And then there's the warrior ethos, which is essentially the same thing, but you apply it specifically to, to warriors. And, and you tell many stories of, of Spartans. You know, every Spartan had their kind of internal destiny of being a warrior, and this is what they did. And we can kind of emulate that in our own lives. And would you say that's kind of act three is turning pro? You know, I hadn't thought of it that way before, but I, I guess it is because it's sort of um, you get the gold like uh, Indiana Jones gets the thing, but it, it he can't convert it to anything yet until he brings it back. Right. And so maybe I'm just following this out as we're as we're talking now. A writer might 
succeed, you know, get lucky. A Broadway, you know, gets an off-Broadway play or something like that. But the question is, or even or an athlete or a warrior, an athlete, you know, catches a touchdown pass, but can he do it next week? And can he do it the week after that, you know, and the week after that? Like uh, Odell Beckham Jr. or something like that. Well, you, know? you tell the story specifically of Roseanne Cash, who already had uh, four hit singles, but somehow she wasn't. That wasn't her turning pro moment. It happened after that, where she had to really start learning the craft of songwriting. Yeah, that to me was a really archetypal moment. It's from her book, composed. And do we want to talk about sure. this here? Yeah. Um, we can talk about anything here. We can just <laughs> talk about what you had to eat for uh, breakfast this morning. <laughs> I'll sort of paraphrase the thing. She, she was already a successful singer. She heard this, her, the latest of her album had four number one hits off it. She's Johnny Cash's daughter. She was like a, you know. And one night she had this dream. And Linda Ronstadt had always been kind of an idol to her in real life. And in the dream, she was at a party. And there was an older man that she somehow knew in the dream. His name was Art. And on one side of the older man was Linda Ronstadt and the other side was Roseanne. And the older Art was talking animatedly to uh, Linda Ronstadt, but paying no attention to Roseanne. And Roseanne sort of, you know, tugged on his sleeve like, you know, hey, how about paying attention to me? And he turned around and looked at her and said, we don't have time for dilettantes. And she woke up from that dream like in a cold sweat and said, oh my God, that's what I am. I'm an amateur, I'm a dabbler, you know, this is art. And this is with four hit singles, she's saying this. With four hit singles, yeah. Because I'm, I don't know the music business, but I'm sure you can have four hit singles pretty much by accident, you know? So Well, she, not me, but maybe. Uh, one maybe could. <laughs> so she just sort of, uh, that was her kind of turning pro moment in the sense that she said, I've got to get real. I got to take my game to the next level. I got to be like Linda Ronstadt. She's like, I haven't really been training my voice. I've got to really get a teacher and really do this. And and uh, she said to herself that on this album, I had wanted to write all the songs myself, but I really only wrote two, and I kind of co-wrote them. And you know, I've got to get in touch with my songwriting courage. I got to find out how to do that. And she made all kinds of changes in her life. And she even got into physical fitness and she started studying painting because she wanted to see a different form of art that didn't have to do with music or didn't have to do with words. But in general, she just suddenly said, I got to turn pro. I'm an amateur. I have to, you know, just like an athlete might say, you know, I can't you know, I keep hurting myself out there on the basketball court of the foot. I got to get into real training. I got to work with somebody that's really good. I got to, that sort of thing, right? So that, if we're talking about Act 3 in the hero's journey, I think that that kind of is what it is. The person has to go from being kind of a flash in the pan and who got lucky and doesn't really know what he's doing or she's doing to a pro that can deliver again and again and again, a Tom Brady that can get out there and throw that pass again and again and again. Well, what are some, what are some aspects of just some like kind of bullets of what is a pro or what is a warrior? So again, I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, oh, I don't know if I'm a pro or not or what the next steps I, are I have to take. What are some things I should be thinking about? Uh, another, another great question, but... Uh, um, I'm trying to avoid the questions you've been asked before because <laughs> no, you've been asked everything. You did it good. You did it good. Um, if it, a good way to think of this is to think of, let's say, a professional athlete, and or or just anybody that goes to work. If your father's a lawyer or whatever it is, one of the things that, it, that uh, an amateur, a pro, shows up every day. Right? Tom Brady is out there on the field every day. If he wakes up with a head cold or, you know, the, the kids are crying, he doesn't just say, geez, I'm going to stay home today. He's got to go out there and do his thing. He shows up every day. He's there all day. He, he is committed over the long haul. This is not a flash in the pan. He's, uh, he's committed at a really deep level. I mean, if you said to Tom Brady, you can't play football anymore, it would be devastating to him, right? Because that's how committed he is. Whereas the amateur is usually committed at an incredibly shallow level. It's like, oh, you know, I've got my music. I've been writing some songs. I've been working on a few poems. You know, I have a little a book I'm working on. Their commitment is like, you know, one millimeter deep. And uh, 
any kind of thing, like whether it's being a warrior or being an athlete or being a, an entrepreneur or being a writer or artist or whatever, it's always about adversity. You're always confronting not only your internal sabotage, but the indifference of the market, uh, competitors that are working against you, your own agent is lazy, you know, that kind of thing. You can't get an agent, that kind of thing. So you're, it's always about adversity. So the difference between an amateur and a pro is an amateur folds in the face of adversity, whereas a pro doesn't take it personally, just operates at that Tom Brady level of, I mean, I wish I would, I know that Tom Brady has been working with uh, an instructor for the mechanics of throwing a forward pass for years. That some older guy, great coach, I would love to see a documentary mm -hmm. on that, you know, because it would apply to all of us, you know. And I'm sure that Tom Brady each year goes to that guy and they start with the absolute fundamentals. They probably start throwing a ball 10 feet to each other, you know, and then just work up and work up and work up. And that's why. That's the difference between a pro and an amateur. An amateur won't, uh, is too proud to do that sort of stuff, to really get back to fundamentals and get back to basics and humble themselves and, and, and learn. You know, it's interesting. I was, um, I was just watching the World Chess Championship, which just concluded ah. uh, about a week ago, and the World Chess Champion, Magnus Carlsen, was having a big problem during the entire match. He kept getting a winning position, and then his opponent... Uh, would draw it. He couldn't close a winning position. Uh -huh. So I was listening to the analysis. It was two top players were analyzing, and one of them said, um, clearly after this match is over, Magnus's trainer is going to have to take a couple months. They'll go to a resort and take a couple months where he'll just set up winning posi one winning position after another and force Magnus to win it. Mm. You know, so he trains yeah, him to yeah. win, cl yeah. close the deal, basically. Yeah. And, you know, and this happens... In anything, again, it's, I just say close the deal, but in sales, it's one thing getting everybody happy, it's the next thing closing the deal. Yeah. And yeah. you have to kind of learn like each step of the way to be to take it all the way through to be the pro. Yeah. And in that case, that may be, in the end, it may be he may have some sort of thing, Magnus, about killer instinct. He may have some block, you know, in his mind about, you know, he... Maybe, maybe he, some ego he or some over fear. identifies maybe with his opponent and maybe a part of him feels like, Oh, I don't want to hurt the guy. You know, I'm going to really, you know, and, uh, and maybe, I don't know. I'm just, I have no idea. Well, it's interesting because, because it's like, it, it's what we were saying earlier. It's a nonstop process. Obviously if someone's already the world champion at something or they've turned pro many years ago, but it's always a process of what yes, it is. There's resistance and turning pro. There's yeah. resistance and turning pro. It it's never always stops. a higher level. You like, know, what's your always... resistance right now in in life? Not, I mean, not this moment, maybe, but uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think it's it's uh, it's almost always going to the next level and having the belief. What is the next level? And having the the belief in yourself to go there. So, um, you know, whatever the next level is for me, I'm sure that I have resistance to that. I don't, I don't really know. I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the throes of a project right now. So that's holding all my attention. When that's over, I'll have to face that. You know, I'll have to know, I'll have to ask myself, you know, what is it? You know, I think it's important to ask that question because they always say the two most dangerous years in a person's life are the year they were born, because there's a high mortality rate when you're born, and the year you retire, which is basically the year you stop asking yourself, what do uh, I do next? I never heard that before, but I think that's exactly true. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm old enough that I'm, I'm kind of approaching that sort of area, you know, but I know I can never do that, you know. So I have to just block that out of my mind because I know if the minute I do that, you know, it's straight down the chute, you know? Well, do you ever feel like, okay, so you've, you've written a lot of good kind of self-help nonfiction books, even if you don't like the word self-help, but The War of Art, <laughs> Turning Pro, all these books. Uh, 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 I, I really like Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit. It's, you know, another, another good one. Um, but they're all, and, and they're all kind of about the same concept. Um, do you ever feel like, okay, I've written about this concept so many times, but I, but they get such great response. How do I figure out a new way to write and express this concept? 
I do think that because the concept is infinitely deep. You know, it has not been plumbed yet by anybody. I mean, it's kind of the nature of life, what we're talking about here, that kind of internal resistance to fulfilling one's destiny, that as we're talking about now, the challenge, one challenge follows another, follows another, follows another. So there's plenty more there for me or for anybody else to to mine. There's no doubt about that. Well, I, I have an idea. Let's just brainstorm for a second. <laughs> so you mentioned something very interesting just now about Roseanne Cash, which is that um, to get to be a better songwriter, she studied painting. Mm -hmm. And that was, among other things. I mean, she did, and she got into physical training. Right. So it seems like to get better at X, sometimes you don't want to do more X. You need to do A, B, and C and see how the language of A, B, and C translates back to X. I think that's you learn exactly true, yes. Yes. I mean, and we and you see this in, in because every... Because A, B, and C are just like X, you know? They're just different ways of looking at it, you know? Right, like, so, so for instance, take painting. Let, let's explore that just for a second in Roseanne Cash's uh, case. How is painting like songwriting? You know, I don't know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm sure that... Uh, well, let's every... say you were to study painting to be a better writer. All right. I mean, uh, every painting has to have a concept, just like a song has to have a concept, Right. It's a, it's a visual concept rather than maybe a, a lyrical concept or a, or a musical concept. Uh, a painting has colors, just like a song has, has sound colors, right? And some paintings are big and some paintings are small. It has a scale, paintings have scale. So I'm sure that there's, and, and, and also I'm sure that the part of the mind that accesses things visually is different than the part of the mind that accesses things orally, sound-wise. Um, I'm just answering off the no, top no. of my head. And also, I think with, with paintings, like you look at the, uh, and you've mentioned this before, um, the, uh, the, the kind of three acts of The Last Supper, but uh, uh, you look at the, the Last Supper itself, that scene, which Da Vinci paints, has, uh, there, were, there were many... Uh, precedents. There were many other artists who had painted the Last Supper who didn't understand, uh, you know, muscles as well as Leonardo da Vinci uh -huh. did, and, and biology and so on. So he was able to kind of take it to the next level. So understanding the history of something, just like understanding the history of writing, helps you become a better writer. You know, I'm just making stuff up, but that's potentially mm -hmm. understanding how to learn the history of another art form can bring back. You can bring that back to understanding the history of where you're trying to turn pro. Yes, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm making it up also as we go along. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I think about that because get, getting back to genre, if you're going to write a thriller, you need to know these are the beats of a thriller. These are the beats of The Firm. These are the beats of The, the Stand and Omen and, you know, and, and so on. Um, and, and, and actually, I wanted to learn a little bit more about that. Like, let's, t let's take... Um, I don't know, a legal thriller. What are the beats that have to be hit in a legal thriller? You should talk to Sean Coyne. He's the guy that really knows that stuff. I yeah. almost wish, he, so his book, The Story Code, excellent book. I almost wish he had just basically said, okay, bam, here's a genre. Here's all the beats you have to you know, hit. No, he's going to do that. It's okay. a story grid, actually. Yeah. But he is going to do that. He's going to do like, you know, love story, thriller. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I would love to see just a short book. It only has to be like 15 yeah. pages long, you know? What are the beats? So I don't really, I can't really kind of answer that for a particular genre, but I know that like, if I were working on a thriller, I would just buy a bunch of them and read them and movies and just watch them and see what are, what are the beats? Because there's also a lot of little mini beats in there too that, uh, you know. And, you, and you're able to look at it from a lot of different angles because again, your, your, your resistance took you in many directions. You went from trying to write these novels in the 70s, to try to do screenwriting, and then you kind of had uh, an all is lost, lost moment, which brought you into writing on a porn movie, right? And that's where you really well, learned. Wasn't exactly the like, uh, causes causational, but anyway, yeah. But 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 tell me what you learned on the the porn movie because I thought that was very interesting. Uh, okay, uh, I got uh, I got hired to do a rewrite on a porn movie. And uh, the producer took me out to breakfast and uh, just gave me kind of two marching orders. 
And both of these turned out to be tremendously valuable to me in other genres. Forget about porn. That's what I mean. Again, painting versus yeah, right. songwriting. So that was great. So, I, I learned more on this thing in like one day. And the first thing he said was, when you get to a sex scene, don't let the story stop. I don't want it to be talk, 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 screw, screw, screw. He says, make sure that the story advances through the sex scene, you know? If it's a, like a private eye at sleeping with a girl, uh, she's gotta tell him something, you know, or he spots something in her bedroom, you know, a photograph of something that, that advances the story. And I thought, wow, that is perfectly applicable, say, to action scenes in, in movies, right? There are a lot of car chases and things like that where the car chase is over and the story is exactly the same spot it was, you know, when it started. And in the audience, we're going, why did we even have that stupid car chase, you know? So, so what's an example of a good car chase where the, it does advance the story? Oh, God, I don't, I don't, can't think of anything off the top of my head. Maybe because most of them are bad. <laughs> so, so what's anyway, the somehow you'd have to come up with some twist to the story or some piece of information that you didn't have before. Um, so then this, the second thing he told you? The second thing he told me was, anytime you have a sex scene, it can't be only sex. There has to be something else going on in the story. And he gave me an example of, uh, let's say the wife and the carpenter are screwing in the bedroom of the suburban home and have the husband coming home from work and he doesn't know what he's about to walk in on. And the wife and the carpenter, they don't know that he's pulling into the driveway, he's opening the front door, it's the middle of the day. He says, have something extra going on in the scene. Next time on The James Altucher Show. I have a writing practice. And what that sort of means is you detach yourself from the outcome and you're looking at the long picture. If somebody says to me, Steve, you're going to live to be 97.8 years old. Are you going to be writing the last day of your life? I'd say yes. And I don't give a shit if it sells or not. I'm in it. It's not about an object. It's about the doing of something every day. I have a trainer at the gym, and I was saying to him something like, yeah, this is a habit, you know, getting here every day. And he says, it's not a habit, it's your life. Hey, thanks for listening. Listen, I have a big favor to ask you, and it will only take 30 seconds or less, and it would mean a huge amount to me. If you like this podcast, please let me know. Please let the team I work with know. Please let my guests know, and you can do this easily by subscribing to the podcast. It's probably the biggest favor you could do for me right now, and it's really simple. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Again, it will only take you 30 seconds or less, and if you subscribe now, it will really help me out a lot. Thanks again. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.